If you have your Bible, hope you do, I invite you to open with me to Psalm chapter 51. And while you're turning there, let me just say how honored, humbled, overwhelmed I am just to be at this conference. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I was here 10 years ago. I had just become a pastor for the first time. And I sat over there in the Galt House Hotel listening to Mark Dever preach from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 on the weight of pastoral ministry, and I felt it. And I listened to John MacArthur talk about 40 years of gospel ministry, and I thought, that's 14 years longer than I've been alive. <laughs> and I listened to John Piper preach a sermon on exposition, and I thought, I'm not even sure if I've, actually, if I've ever actually preached a biblical sermon. Uh, how am I going to pastor? So needless to say, I never could have imagined the friendship that you brothers would invite me into. And I am deeply grateful and totally undeserving of your invitation. So my topic is martyrdom and mission. Why reformers died in their day how we must live in ours. The year was 1555. It was nearly 40 years after Luther had nailed 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg, nearly 20 years after Calvin had written his first edition of the Institutes in Latin. The church in England was under fire, literally, from a royal foe named Queen Mary, whom we've heard about. 1555. Over the next four years, 288 people would be burned at the stake for their Protestant faith. Men and women, church leaders and common laborers, even children. The first, J.C. Ryle wrote, to break the ice and cross the river as a martyr in Mary's reign was John Rogers. Rogers received his education at Cambridge, became a Catholic priest, but quickly became disillusioned with the teachings of the Catholic Church. And in God's providence, he found himself in Holland where he just so happened to meet a man by the name of William Tyndale. Tyndale taught Rogers the Bible and the gospel, and Rogers would never be the same. When Tyndale was arrested months after they met, he left his Old Testament manuscripts with Rogers, who in the days to come would compile them into a complete English Bible under the code name Thomas Matthew. The Matthew's Bible would become the first officially authorized version of the Bible in the English language. Rogers went on to pastor in Germany, but his heart was for the people of England. So he returned to London in 1548 with his wife, Ariana, and their eight children at the time. There he preached, pastored, safely under the reign of King Edward VI until the day when Edward died and soon thereafter, Edward's half-sister Mary proclaimed herself queen. Rogers knew where Mary stood on religion, steadfast with the church at Rome against all Protestant teaching, teachings and she arrived in London on Thursday, August 3rd, 1553. And Rogers was appointed to preach the following Sunday. This was his moment, and he boldly proclaimed the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone, and warned the church against pestilent popery and all idolatry. Commenting on Roger's sermon that day, one biographer said, there was never any position in the whole history of the Reformation, all things considered, where the responsibilities thrown upon one single man were greater and the results more important. The same historian went on to say of Rogers, his conduct that day was more than noble, it was magnificent. Rogers' sermon that day would be his last. A week later, he was placed under house arrest with his wife and now 10 children, with another on the way. Six months later, he was put into prison where he would live in cruel conditions for the next year, which led to January 1555, where he was summarily examined on three occasions and subsequently condemned for two offenses, 
One, standing against the church at Rome, and two, saying that in the sacrament of the altar, there is not substantially nor really the natural body and blood of Christ. Roger, Rogers hadn't been able to communicate with his wife, his family, the entire time he had been in prison. He had not even met his youngest child. So he pleaded for an opportunity to see them, or at least speak to his wife before he died. His request was refused, and the next morning he was roused from his cell. He was led outside into the streets of the parish he once pastored. He walked in the shadow of the church where he had preached. Thousands of spectators lined the way, and in that sea of faces he saw his family, his wife holding a baby, the first time he'd ever seen his youngest child, with 10 other children standing beside, looking at their daddy. One writer said their anxious faces were all fixed on him and their voices of pain reached his ears. Another remarked, it's difficult even to imagine anything more tender and affecting than this parting scene, this last adieu to a beloved wife and so numerous an offspring, all in tears. He stood the shock with the feelings of a father and husband, but with the unshaken confidence of a Christian marching to his death. John Fox, in his book of martyrs, tells us that he walked calmly to the stake, saying over and over again the 51st Psalm. When he arrived, the sheriff gave him one last opportunity to recant, revoke his confession of faith, to which Rogers responded, that which I have preached, I will seal with my blood. Within moments, the fire at Rogers' feet was set ablaze, his body slowly began to burn, and as he lifted his arms high in the air, Ryle said, the enthusiasm of the crowds knew no bounds. They rent the air with thunders of applause. For up to that day, Raoul said, men could not tell how English reformers would behave in the face of death, and they could hardly believe that some would actually give their bodies to be burned for their religion. And some it would be. Within days, others would face the same fate. Nicholas Ridley, who Matt mentioned earlier, was a fellow prisoner with Rogers. He wrote to other pastors who had been in prison saying, I thank our Lord God and Heavenly Father by Christ that since I heard of our dear brother Rogers departing and stout confession of Christ and his truth even to the death, since that time, I say, I have no longer felt any lumpish heaviness in my heart. John Leaf, a 19-year-old apprentice of John Rogers, was arrested, asked if he believed what Rogers had taught him. Leaf answered, not only did he believe every doctrine Rogers had taught him from God's word, but he was ready to meet the same death that Rogers had faced, and so he did. History said, burned alive with a cheerfulness and an unshaken resolution that were, were remarkable for one so young and that would have pleased his teacher in the faith. John Rogers, Nicholas Ridley, John Leaf, I could read 285 other names who would follow in the fire of their footsteps across England under the reign of Queen Mary, in addition to all the saints who did the same across other countries during the Reformation. So see it, brothers. As this conference closes, lift your eyes across this Colosseum and look back one more time across history. See this day, 500 years ago, when Our brothers in the faith were emboldened to die for their belief. See the day when pastors explored theology not as a merely academic exercise, but as a life and death endeavor. See this day when wives and children saw in their husbands and dads a willingness to sacrifice and suffer for the sake of what they studied. See in this day men who gladly embraced martyrdom for the sake of mission. See them, and as this conference closes, let us be reminded by them that it is altogether right for us in this room to give our lives preserving this gospel in the church. And brothers, be reminded by them that it is ultimately required for us in this room to give our lives proclaiming this gospel in the world.
So my questions in this talk are twofold. Two questions I've been asking in preparation for this message. My first question is, why did they die? Why, what was, what was the reason why these reformers died? What was the root motive behind Reformation martyrs? And then my second question flowing from the first is, how should we live? How should we live? Is there anything we need to hear across the halls of history from these heroes of our faith? Should we die for the same things for which they died? What might these martyrs say to us, particularly in a day in which the church has been so complicit in the promotion of cultural Christianity? Our day in which the church has become so complacent through priority on material comfort. Let us be honest, brothers, pastors. A theology of martyrdom is not a prominent feature in contemporary Western Christian thought. A theology of danger that leads to death is not a primary topic of conversation in our churches. Now sure, we possess rightful disdain for theologies that prioritize prosperity in this world. Yet I fear that such theologies have invaded our homes and our churches far more than we would like to admit. Surely we must confess that our views of safety and security in this room and in our churches are often far more American than they are biblical, far more concerned in the preservation of our lives in this country than they are with the exaltation of our Lord among the nations. And so for this reason, I submit we have much to learn from the Reformation regarding how to live based on why they died. So let's take the two questions in order. First, why did they die? And as I've asked this question, I've come to an answer I didn't expect. More specifically, I've come to a text I didn't expect. I'm not sure if you noticed, but John Fox, when and he was recounting John Rogers' death, he remarked that as John Rogers walked to his death, he kept repeating the 51st Psalm. So as he walked past his wife and children, in addition to the throngs of people he loved and once led, these were the words that were on his lips. And as I read about Roger's repetition of Psalm 51, I think, why this psalm? And then I read about Roland Taylor, the third martyr under Mary's reign, a pastor betrayed by two of his parishioners, thrown into prison. The night before he was put to death, he was allowed to have dinner with his wife and son. He gave his son a Latin book that contained notable sayings from old martyrs. In the back of the book, he wrote these words, I say to my wife and my children, the Lord gave you unto me, the Lord has taken me from you, and you from me, blessed be the name of the Lord. God careth for sparrows and for the hairs of our heads. I have ever found him more faithful and favorable than is any father or husband. Trust ye therefore in him by the means of our dear Savior Christ's merits. Believe, love, fear, and obey him. Count me not dead, for I shall certainly live and never die. I go before and you shall follow after to our long home. The next morning he was led to the place where he would burn. Fox says that when he had prayed, he went to the stake, he kissed it. He set himself into a pitch barrel, which they had put for him to stand in. He stood with his back upright against the stake, his hands folded together, his eyes toward that heaven, and from there he began to quote scripture in English, the language of the people, and as he did, he was struck on the face and told to only speak scripture in Latin. Taylor didn't stop his English, though, and you'll never guess what scripture he was quoting, quoting for all the people to hear. Psalm 51. So I read about John Rogers, Roland Taylor, then I read another historian who said that Psalm 51 was traditionally recited by English reformers at their executions, and I thought, why? Why Psalm 51? This is not a text when I, I think of when I think of martyrdom. It's a glorious psalm, to be sure. It's one of the most well-known, beloved psalms in all the Bible. Spurgeon commented on the challenge of preaching it, saying such a psalm may be wept over, absorbed into the soul, exhaled again in devotion, but commented on, ah, where is he who, having attempted it, can do other than blush at his defeat? So I'm set up for defeat. There's so much here, but that's just it. What is it that's here that made this psalm so precious to Reformation martyrs in their final moments? I invite you to think about this with me. Let's read this psalm that I'm confident you've heard before, but let me invite you right now to hear it differently. 
Hear these words spoken from the mouths of men who are walking past their wives and children to their death. Hear these words shouted from the mouths of martyrs whose bodies are being set ablaze as they cry, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, flames are coming up. I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So what truths does this psalm contain that compelled martyrs to their deaths and comforted martyrs in their deaths? As I've tried to answer that question, at least three truths have come to the surface from this text. Three truths that these men who were martyred believed. Three truths that drove them as they died. Number one, they believed their depravity was deserving of damnation. They believed their depravity was deserving of damnation. See how the psalm describes sin in different ways over and over and over again. Verse one, blot out my transgressions. Verse two, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse three, I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Verse four, against you, you only have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. Verse five, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Verse nine, hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Sin, iniquity, transgression, evil. Different words that combine together to show the depth of David's depravity. Now we know this psalm was written in response to his adultery with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah, but David knows sin is not an isolated incident for him. As Philip Jensen noted the first day of this conference, sin was not just an isolated incident for David. It utterly inundated him. John Piper pointed out last night, it bound him. Behold, verse five says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Obviously, not a reference to an immoral relationship David's mother had or the specific circumstances surrounding his birth, but a reference to the reality that affects every single one of us in this room from the moment we are born into this world, born into sin, in that sense dominated by depravity, destined to defy God. Verse four, against you, you only have I sinned. This psalm, a reminder that while our sin undoubtedly affects the people around us, the worst consequence of sin is the reality that you and I have defied the infinitely holy God of the universe. And as a result, we deserve death. In the words of David, my bones are crushed, my joy is gone, I'm guilty of shedding blood. 
The psalm reminds us of the infinite seriousness of sin before a holy God. In defying God, we have destroyed ourselves. It's the story of all scriptures. The BD reference to Genesis 3. One sin, they ate a piece of fruit. One sin. And from that one sin, death and condemnation came to all men. From one sin came all the effects of sin across history, around the world. Natural evil, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, moral evil, world wars, ethnic genocide, murder, rape. The kidnapping of eight-year-old girls in Nigeria. They're training to be suicide bombers. All of that goes back to one sin. And we in this room have committed millions of them. See the severity of sin, all of scripture, the depravity, the depth of depravity in all of our hearts, the reformers did. Isn't it interesting, even somewhat striking, to hear these men in what history would call the most, their most climactic moment as Christian heroes. They're dying for their faith as they stand for the truth, yet we don't hear these men in any way nodding to the nobility of their actions. Instead, in quoting Psalm 51, they're drawing attention to the depth of their transgressions. Even as they died for Christ, they believe, they know that they are sinners to the core. And this is a significant historical note for even as John Piper shared on the panel the other night, I am, we should be under no illusion that these men were perfectly worthy of our emulation or imitation. Much like the author of this psalm, the tragic hero of the Old Testament, as wonderful as these men were, they were also weak and wicked. And when standing before a holy sovereign, they were no less sinners than anyone else, including the adversaries who arrested them, the cardinals who condemned them, even the very queen who enjoined their execution. They were all guilty before God, and they all knew that, they knew that death was ultimately their due. And on top of that, they knew that the fires they would endure were nowhere near what they actually deserved. Your perspective of earthly embers changes when you've been saved from an eternal inferno. It's certainly true for John Rogers. We have very little from what he wrote in his presence, uh, prison cell, but one of Rogers' sons, when given access to his father's room after he died, found hidden away writings that contained his final reflections. And in them, among other things, John Rogers wrote shortly before his death, we, of and of ourselves, are polluted with many filthy sins, which if the measureless, unspeakable mercy and love of God in Christ did not put away by not imputing them to us, would have brought us to everlasting damnation and death perpetual. John Rogers, other Reformation martyrs, knew their depravity was deserving of damnation, a reality that set the stage for the second truth so clearly communicated in Psalm 51. Number two, they believed their salvation was found solely in God's mercy, separate from their merit. They believed their salvation was found solely in God's mercy, separate from their merit. So just as this psalm uses a myriad of words to describe man's sin, the same psalm uses a mosaic of terms to describe God's grace. Verse one, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Mercy, abundant mercy, steadfast love. Think about what David is asking God to do. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from all my sin. He's asking God to unsin him, to remove all iniquity from him. Talk about a bold request to ask the holy God whom you have defied to act as if you have not defied him. And here's the deal. David knows there's no basis in himself for this. He's committed two sins for which the law of Moses provided no forgiveness, adultery and murder. The penalty for both of these sins according to God's law was death. David has nothing in himself to which he can appeal. So what does he do? He cries out for God to do what only God can do. Here is request, verse two, wash me, cleanse me. Verse seven, purge me, wash me. Verse nine, Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. 
Verse 12, restore to me, uphold me. Verse 14, deliver me. Verse 15, oh Lord, open my lips. You see it? He's asking God to do all these things because he knows he can't make these things happen. He even says it in verse 15. He says, I'd give you a sacrifice if I could, but I can't. There's nothing I can do. Oh God, only you can do these things. Only you can save me. And this this, this reverted all week long. This was the cry of the reformers in their day. Salvation is found solely in God's mercy, separate from our merit. We've heard it over and over and over again. But do we realize how precious this really is? Do we realize what these men were dying for? J.C. Rowell wrote a paper entitled The Burning of Our English Reformers and the Reason Why They Were Burned, and his paper so struck me because in it he wrote, listen to this, he said, great indeed would be our mistake if we suppose that these martyrs suffered for the vague charge of refusing submission to the Pope or desiring to maintain the independence of the church in England. Nothing of the kind. The principal reason why they were burned was because they refused one of the peculiar doctrines of the Romish church. On that doctrine, in almost every case, hinge their life or death. If they admitted it, they might live. If they refused it, they must die. He continued, the doctrine in question was the real presence of the body and blood of Christ and the consecrated elements of bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Did they or did they not believe that the body and blood of Christ were really, that is corporally, Literally, locally, materially present under the forms of bread and wine after the words of consecration were pronounced. Did they or did they not? That was the simple question. If they did not believe and admit it, they were burned. And it's true. John Rogers recounted his interrogation by the church saying, I was asked whether I believed in the sacrament to be the very body and blood of our Savior Christ that was born of the Virgin Mary and hanged on the cross. Really and substantially, I answered, I think it to be false. I cannot understand really and substantially to signify otherwise than corporally. But corporally, Christ is only in heaven. And so Christ cannot be corporally in your sacrament. Same statement was made by subsequent men and women. Church leaders, common laborers, Rollins White. This was a fisherman. He couldn't read. And so he had his son taught to read so that every night his family would gather around the table after dinner and the boy would read the New English Bible to the family. And in the course of doing so, he came to belief in salvation through faith in God's mercy. When his belief became public, he was condemned to die. History tells us he came to the place where his poor wife and children stood weeping. The sight of them so pierced his heart, tears trickled down his face. When everything was ready, they set white on the stake, erected a stand upon which a priest stepped up and began speaking about the Catholic doctrine of the sacraments. White, a fisherman, cries out to the priest, you wicked hypocrite. Do you presume to prove your false doctrine by Scripture? Look at the text. Look at the text. Fisherman expositor, did not Christ say, do this in remembrance of me? That didn't go over well. Immediately they lit the fire. Fox says his, burr, his legs were so quickly consumed by the flames that his body briskly fell over and burned. John Hullier was taken to the stake, bound with a chain, placed in a pitch barrel. Fire was applied to the reeds and the wood. As he began to burn, people started throwing books into the fire to be burned with him. One of the books was on the communion service. It was a book that countered Catholic teaching on the Lord's Supper, taught salvation through faith alone. So Hullier caught the book held it high above the flames, opened it, and read it joyfully, out loud, until the fire and smoke deprived him of sight. Then he pressed the book to his heart, thanking God for giving him this precious gift in his last moments. And it wasn't just men. Agnes Snoth, Anne Wright, Joan Soule, Joan Katmer, four women alongside one man, John Lomas, questioned concerning transubstantiation, sentenced to burn together on two stakes in one fire where Fox says they sang hosannas together until the breath of life was extinct. So are we hearing this? Why did these reformers die? Don't miss it. They died for the Lord's Supper. They died because they knew that Rome's doctrine of real presence undercut gospel grace. 
For if receiving communion involves receiving Christ, if eating the communion feast is necessary to experience Christ's forgiveness, then man's merit becomes a means of obtaining Christ's mercy. And the reformers would have nothing to do with it. Doctrine like this was decisive for them. Truth like this was not trivial for them. So a pastor looks into the eyes of his wife and 11 children, one of whom he's never even held. A fisherman looks into the eyes of his wife and his children, including the little boy who first read the gospel to him. And together they say, salvation by God's mercy, separate from our merit, is worth our lives. Salvation's all of mercy, kids. My bride, salvation's all of mercy. If we lose that, we lose everything. We, ha we have hope, not in our merit, only in his mercy. Not in our merit, in his merit. One Protestant man was sentenced to be beheaded. History says he went cheerfully to his place of execution. When he arrived at the blocks, he was surrounded by friars, one of whom bent down whispered in his ear, I know you have great reluctance publicly to abjure your faith, so just whisper your confession in my ear and I will absolve your sins. Protestant man loudly replied back to him, trouble me not, friar, for I have confessed my sins to God and obtained absolution through the merits of Jesus Christ. Then he turned to his executioner and said, let me not be pestered with these men. Perform your duty, at which point his head was struck off at a single blow. Oh, Mark Dever began this week with a great word, imputation, the righteousness of Christ credited to our account by the sheer mercy of God. He showers righteousness on sinners just like we're his son. I remember when my wife and I were engaged in the year before we were married, we were living totally different lives. I was finishing college, living on little income, actually no income, had no cash flow, scraping by during my last semesters, eating ramen noodles for most of my meals. Meanwhile, Heather had graduated from college, was teaching in an elementary school, which meant she had an income. She had cash flow, so she didn't have to eat ramen noodles. After 12 months of waiting to be married, we finally stood in front of a crowd of our friends and family ready to commit our lives to each other. And on that day, I received so many wonderful things, the most important of which was a beautiful, godly wife. But do you know what else I received on that day? Cash flow. <laughs> it was glorious. <laughs> At one moment, I stood there with nothing in my bank account. I said two words, I do. And all of a sudden, my bank account was full. And I didn't have to do anything to earn it. I didn't have to go to her school, teach her, five-year-old kids. I didn't have to get a job anywhere else for that matter. Simply because my life was now united with hers, praise God, everything that belonged to her became mine. Oh, brothers and sisters, in a much, much greater way, when we come to Jesus, we put our faith in him, we trust in him, praise God. At that moment, everything that belongs to him becomes ours. And not, not, not because of any work we have ever done and will ever do, but solely because of the work he's done for me and you. Praise God. Salvation is found solely in God's mercy, separate from our merit. He, Jesus has lived the life we could not live. He has died the death we deserve to die. And Jesus has conquered the enemy we could not conquer. He has risen from the dead. And simply, solely, by faith in his love for us, we can be cleansed of all our heinous sins and reconciled to a holy God to know and enjoy him forever and ever. This is the greatest news in all the world. Which, which leads to the third truth here in Psalm 51 that these reformers believed. They believed that love like this, love like this was worth losing their lives to proclaim. They believed that love like this was worth losing their lives to proclaim Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. 
Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. See it. See how washing before God, washing by God, inevitably leads to worship of God. And then see how washing from God inevitably leads to witness for God. I'm going to teach this to transgressors and sinners. And it makes sense. Possession of this good news compels proclamation of this good news. And this is where we must be careful not to miss the point. Please listen to me closely. These martyrs did not die just because they believed the gospel. They died because they broadcast the gospel. They didn't die just because they studied the gospel. They died because they spoke it. Persecution only rises when proclamation resounds. If you stay silent about your faith, you stay safe from persecution. It's when you speak about your faith that you now step into persecution. And that's what these reformers were doing. They were sharing it in their homes. They were teaching it in their churches. They were proclaiming it in their towns. And it cost them everything they had. John Rogers had a choice that Sunday after Mary came to London. He could preach a good sermon from a random text. He could keep his life. He could keep his pastorate. He could continue as dad and husband. Or he could preach a gospel sermon filled with reformation truth. And he could lose his life. John Rogers chose the latter. Why? Because he couldn't keep this good news to himself. He didn't just love the gospel. He loved people who needed the gospel. And he was willing to give his life so they might know it. And right before he died, that's exactly what he did. He exhorted everyone watching his execution to embrace the doctrines of gospel grace. And Fox concludes, By his death, he demonstrated the reality of the ancient observation that the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. For instead of being intimidated by the severity of his sufferings, multitudes were encouraged by his magnanimous example. And many who had no religion were led, by watching this, led to inquire into the cause for which pious, learned, and benevolent men were so contented to lay down their lives. And thus, they were changed from atheists or Catholics by the grace of God to the profession of the gospel. Apparently, when you know the depth of God's love for sinners, you'll lose your life for their salvation. They believed that their depravity was deserving of damnation. They believed that salvation was found solely in God's mercy, not in their merit. And they believed that love like this was worth losing their lives to proclaim. So how shall we live? In light, yes, of the examples of these reformers, but far more importantly, based on the exposition of the text, how shall we live? I offer us three exhortations as we close this conference. Number one, brothers, pastors, let us prioritize theological precision among God's people. Let us prioritize theological precision among God's people. Kevin, John, both used this word yesterday. I want to bring it back today. I I trust that it's clear after these last three days, doctrine matters. Theology matters. How we understand God's word matters. How we carry out God's worship matters. The Lord's Supper matters. We live in a day We know this, where doctrine like we're discussing is diluted and pragmatism is prized in its place. The deceptive danger of just doing what works regardless of God's word. The subtle snare, slippery slope that inevitably surfaces when we disconnect methodology from theology. This tantalizing temptation to twist God's truth in an attempt to make sermons more palatable or strategies more successful. I I lead a missions organization focused on planting churches around the world. I see the plague of pragmatism everywhere I turn. From insider movements to man-centered methodologies, so much of contemporary missiology, instead of starting with God's word, starts with the world. 
and ask, well, what's working where? And missionaries begin devising mission strategies based on pragmatic observation instead of biblical foundation. Now, sure, we go to Scripture in order to try to back up what we're doing, but there's a critical difference between looking to Scripture for permission to do what we think is best and looking to Scripture for direction according to what God has said is best. But the pressure's there to produce statistics. After all, how are we gonna boost morale in the field? How are we gonna raise money back home? I received a flyer from a missions organization in my mail saying for $20 a month, you can plant a church a month in said country. I went on to talk about the low cost of pastors and the return rates in their reports. Thousands and thousands of conversions recorded, churches planted across said country. It's not an outlier organization. I didn't know whether to weep in sadness or wail in anger. Brothers, do we realize what's at stake here? Do we realize what we're doing around the world in diluting the doctrines of conversion and the church? We're not just belittling the bride for whom Christ spilled his blood. We're devaluing his word in favor of our work. We're defaming his reputation for our renown. Practices like this prostitute the nations for the sake of our numbers, and we must repent. But here's the deal, it's not just overseas, it's here, it's here. Missionaries are doing there what they've seen modeled here and the churches who've sent them and the pastors who've trained them. You say, well, I'm not training missionaries. Seminaries and mission organizations are doing that. No, you're doing that. The people who will plant churches around the world are learning the church from you, pastor. Train them well. Train them to love God's word. Train them to love God's gospel. Train them to love and value and esteem the church. Train them to love the Lord's Supper. And just in case that's not communicating in the positive, they put it in the negative. Stop sending missionaries who have a low view of God's word. Stop sending missionaries who have uncertain, unclear, minimalistic, man-centered understandings of God's gospel. Stop sending missionaries who don't know how to define and direct and defend the church with doctrinal precision. Stop sending missionaries who don't love the Lord's Supper and all that it means and all that it stands for. Nominal Christianity is not what the nations need. Lazy approaches to theology, lethargic attitudes to truth won't cut it across the anti-Christian cultures of the world. So brothers, train and send missionaries and be men for whom precise attention to the doctrines of scripture, salvation, the church, even the Lord's Supper is more precious to you than life itself. Let us prioritize theological precision among God's people. Second, let us mobilize for sacrificial mission among all peoples. Let us mobilize for sacrificial mission among all peoples. So as we have seen, the need is great for salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to be preached here, in our culture, across our culture. Most of us live and pastor Here in North America, this conference is aimed at equipping us to live and pastor faithfully in North America. But I'm convinced we would be remiss if we didn't intentionally lift our eyes for just a moment to look beyond where most of us live and most of us pastor. Surely the reformers beckon us to at least lift our eyes to Europe to the countries where they died for the sake of the gospel. In the UK, where Rogers and so many of these martyrs lost their lives, I'm told that if you're in your 20s, there's a 97% chance that not only do you not go to church, and not only are you not a follower of Christ, but there's a 97% chance you don't even know a follower of Christ. In Luther's Germany, A mere 2% of the population believes the gospel of God's grace. It's practically unreached, Germany. There's about twice as many Muslims in Germany as there are Christians. Keep traveling westward to Europe's intersection with Asia. We come to Turkey, 80 million people in Turkey. You know how many of these Turks are followers of Christ? 
about 5,000. 5,000. There's twice as many Christians in this room than there are among 80 million Turks. Almost 80 million people. Completely unreached. Which doesn't just mean lost. So there's a difference between lost and unreached. So people are just as lost in Turkey as they are in Tennessee. They're apart from people, apart from God, apart from Christ, they're lost. But here's the difference. There's a few churches in Tennessee. And, and there's Christians in Tennessee. There's not a lot of churches in Turkey. Not a lot of Christians there. They, they don't have access to the gospel. They don't know a Christian. They don't have a church to see the gospel visibly portrayed and hear the gospel verbally proclaimed. They're unreached by the gospel. That's what it means to be unreached. They don't have access to the gospel. That's why we don't say in our churches, I don't know why we talk about unreached people all around the world. There's unreached people in my office. There's unreached people in my neighborhood. Don't say that. Those people aren't unreached. Say, well, how do you know? Because they're in your office. They're in your neighborhood. They have access to the gospel. How do you know? You're it. We're talking about people who don't have access to this good news. They don't have access to it. They've never heard it. They've never heard it. And if something doesn't change, they're going to die without ever even hearing it. And based on Psalm 51 and the testimony of all scripture, they're going to go to hell without ever even hearing about how they could have gone to heaven. This is not right. This cannot be tolerable for us. What will it take for the concept of unreached peoples to become totally intolerable to us in the church? I sat there last night listening to John Piper's sermon, just overwhelmed by God's grace to me. I was born into a place in the world where I've heard the gospel ever since the day I was born. I sat there just about the fact that I had nothing to do with where I was born. Why was I born here? And not in Turkey, or Saudi Arabia, or Somalia. I don't have an answer to that question, apart from God's sovereign grace. But here's what I do know. I didn't receive the sovereign grace so that I can sit back and say, God ordained for me to be reached, and God ordained for them to be unreached, that's just the way it is. No. No, God ordained for them to be reached. Revelation 5, 9, Jesus shed his blood to ransom, to purchase people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He ransomed them for a reason. Jesus ransomed them so they might be reached by him. You know what? He's ordained you and me to be the ones to reach them. His church, sinners saved by this gospel. Just think about what we heard last night. We know the primary problem for every person in the entire world. We heard it last night. They're all in bondage. Everybody, 7.2 billion people in the world in bondage. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel the glory of Christ. So what do they need? We saw it last night. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, they need God to give the light of the knowledge of the glory, knowledge of his glory in the face of Christ. But here's the question. How's he gonna do it? How's that gonna happen? How is God gonna shine light, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, into blind minds, 2 Corinthians 4, 4? The answer is right in the middle. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we preach Christ. See it, feel it, realize it. We know the problem for every person in the world and we have the answer for every person in the world. So preach it, proclaim it, 
brothers, there is an eternal cancer that's killing the nations, and we have the cure, the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. They need to hear it. Keep traveling across Asia to India, where right now, right now, a hundred million Hindus are coming together for a Hindu festival come called Kumbh Mela. It's the largest religious gathering in the world. We think 10,000 people is a lot of people, and it is. We're talking about a hundred million of them who will come together, strip down to nothing, cover themselves with ashes, then bathe in a contaminated river that they believe will cleanse them from all their sins. 100 million of them. Brothers, we've got to tell them only Jesus can cleanse you from your sins. Somebody's got to tell them only Jesus can cleanse you from your sins. Or go to Iran, the northern Luri people, 1.5 million of them. No churches, zero churches, no scriptures. They don't have the Bible. The good news of the gospel is not in their language. So, so I've just got to ask at the close of this conference on the Reformation, in light of reformers like William Tyndale and John Rogers who died so that people could read the Bible, I'm just compelled to ask who's going to die so the Northern Lurry can read the Bible? Who's going to die so that Hindus in India can be cleansed and freed from bondage to bathing in a contaminated river? Who's going to die so they can live? You might think saying die just sounds too dramatic here, but it's the right word because the northern Luri people aren't going to read their Bible in their language without someone giving their life to getting it in their language. And 100 million Hindus celebrating Kumela aren't going to hear the gospel without thousands of Christians leaving behind the pursuits, pleasures, possessions, and plaudits of this world to get it to them. So brothers, pastors across this room, let us die to our desire for a nice, comfortable Christian spin on the American dream, and let us shepherd the members of our churches to do the same. Let us mobilize for sacrificial mission among all peoples, and ultimately, third exhortation. Third exhortation. Let's prioritize theological position among God's people. Let's mobilize for sacrificial mission among all peoples. And third, let's live, lead, and long for the day when reformation will be consummation. Let's live, lead, and long for the day when reformation will be consummation. So we heard in the very first message of this conference that the reformation is not over. 500 years ago, men and women were proclaiming the gospel of God's grace and they were being burned alive for it. But it's not just then, it's happening today. We have brothers and sisters right now who are imprisoned in North Korea. We have brothers and sisters in Pakistan whose church buildings are being charred. We have a few brothers and sisters in Somalia. If they share the truth of salvation with their family, they will have their throats slit. All over the world, people are dying today for the gospel of God's grace. The Reformation is indeed not over. But don't you long for the day when it will be over. Don't you long for the day when, like we heard yesterday, our waiting will conclude. When the days of sanctification will finally give way to the day of glorification. As John MacArthur was preaching from Revelation, I was reminded of what he writes just a few chapters later. In Revelation 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? I just read this, thinking about these martyrs have been reading about. And they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. John realizes the number of martyrs is not complete. And the line of men and women 
slain for the sovereign Lord lives on in our day. But praise be to God, we have a promise here that one day these figurative fires of martyrdom are going to be finished. And the kingdom of God is going to come. And the will of God is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a day worth living for, leading for, longing for. The reformers were fixed on that day. The French ambassador who was there at John Rogers' death wrote home, and this is how he described the scene. He said, it was as if this man was walking to his wedding. Roland Taylor, who I mentioned earlier, was about two miles from the place where he would die. The sheriff asked him how he felt. His reply, God be praised, Master Sheriff, never better. For now, I'm almost at home. I lack but just two styles to go over, and I am even at my father's house. John Bradford, who was burned with the 19-year-old John Leaf that I mentioned earlier, kissed the stake, turned to the 19-year-old, saying, Be of good comfort, brother, for we shall have a merry supper with the Lord this night. Helen Stark, a mom with a newborn child, was sentenced to be put in a sack and drowned. Her husband, also sentenced to die, but separate from her. He would die first, then her. So she followed him to his execution, gave him a kiss, and said, Husband, rejoice, for we've lived together many joyful days, but this day in which we must die ought to be most joyful unto us both, because we must have joy forever. Therefore, I will not bid you good night, for we shall suddenly meet with joy in the kingdom of heaven. She was ta- after watching her husband die, she was taken to the place where she would be drowned. She entrusted her newborn child and other children to the neighbor's care and was plunged to her death. All these men and women knew this world was not their home. They were living, leading, longing for another world. They were looking forward to a wedding feast and a marriage supper. And brothers, sisters, one day we're going to join them there. And that's a day worth living, leading, longing for. Brothers, pastors, we in this conference deserve damnation. And we have been delivered from never-ending death based on nothing we have done. Not one of us is in this room by our own merit. We're only here by his mercy. God loves us so much. And love like this is worth losing our lives to proclaim. With theological precision among God's people for sacrificial, safety-surrendering, world-saking, life-giving, death-defying mission among all peoples until the day when we gather with every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and we won't be talking about reformation anymore. Instead, we'll be experiencing the consummation of our king and his kingdom. May God bless the pastors and churches in this room to hasten the coming of 